There's not really any place I can tell you to turn to in the Bible because there is no one text that we're going to be using today. We're going to be using the whole Bible. Uh, Today we're going to be beginning a four-week series entitled All About Salvation. In the coming weeks, we will look at the life stages of salvation, at how we receive salvation, and how salvation will change our lives forever. The first step, though, is to understand our salvation. And in order to do so, we must first determine exactly what salvation is. Hence, the title of today's message, What is Salvation? Our intent today is to discover what the word salvation means and what God's word tells us that salvation will do. The best way I could find to do this is to uncover as many of the attributes of salvation as I could. As you'll see in just a moment, uh, we begin looking at some of the meanings Uh, that I discovered during the preparation of this message. First, we look at good old Webster and see what Webster says about salvation. According to the dictionary, salvation is one, a saving or being saved. Two, a person or thing that saves or rescues. And three, theologically, the saving of the soul from sin and death. Doesn't tell us a whole lot, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. One of my favorite reference tools when I'm working on sermons is Nave's Topical Bible. Nave's defines salvation as saving from sin or a danger, deliverance, the state of being preserved, a deliberate planned guarding and protecting of something felt to be precious. Now I like that last little part right there. It really made me feel good. God is protecting something that he considers precious. Me. And in your case, you. In short, for scriptural purposes, what we find in definitions, salvation is a result of being saved. Now that's really not a whole bunch to ponder because salvation and saved both come from the same root word of being of save. So, unless you understand what being saved means, just saying that salvation is being saved doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't help you understand salvation. And that's why I want to look at the attributes of salvation. What, what things can you say about salvation? You know, is it blue? Is it is it cold? Attributes. Things that you can say, this is true about salvation. Of course, blue and cold are not among them. So, let's begin our journey into a deeper understanding of our topic. First thing we need to do is we need to understand why we need salvation. For that, we look at Genesis 3, 13-15. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. The serpent did it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, capital S, he, capital H, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, capital H, heel. Now listen to that last again. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Because of the capitalization, we know this is intended to be a clear reference to Jesus. We know the story that precedes these verses very well. Even Cody knows the stories that precede these verses. He knew them when he was four or five years old. 
he drew a picture telling us what it was all about. God gave Adam and Eve the full run of the Garden of Eden with only one restriction. They must not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. That's all he told them. God did not give them a detailed reason. He essentially just said, do anything you want except this one thing. And as we discussed in depth last week, man is incapable, in the most perfect environment even, of accepting one tiny little limit on his life. So what happened? They broke God's command. And sin and death were set loose upon the earth to roam and corrupt God's creation and God's creatures. That is why we are in need of salvation. To free us from the curse brought upon us by the first ancestors in our family tree. Simply put, man was cursed to toil the ground, which was also cursed with thorns and thistles, and woman was cursed with extremely painful childbirth. Weeds and contractions, that was the curse. Blame them both on Adam and Eve. And perhaps more so on Adam than on Eve, because Adam was charged with leading his wife in her spiritual life in following the Lord. So take note, husbands, we are accountable for our wives' lives if we are truly leading a spiritual life. However, even in God's holy wrath, while announcing the consequences of their sinful actions, God also proclaimed a way for the curse to be lifted. Speaking to the serpent, also known as Satan, God said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God proclaimed that day in the garden that his son, Jesus the Christ, would be the one that would defeat Satan and provide man with salvation, freeing those who would follow him from the punishment for sin, which is eternal spiritual death. Although those words were never explicitly spoken, the meaning of what was said is clearly revealed as we read the context of the entire Bible. Our Heavenly Father promised salvation. We see previews of the kind of salvation that was to come throughout the Old Testament. In Exodus 15, the first two verses, then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Now this was right after they had crossed the Red Sea, which the Lord had parted and then caused to close in on Pharaoh's army. So they're praising him for saving them. The Father provided the children of Israel with our first notable attribute of salvation. Freedom. <coughs> in 2 Samuel 14.4, Yet God does not take away life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. This is another preview of salvation to come. God devising ways for his children to avoid death and to return to communion with him. Yes? What scripture was that? 2 Samuel 14. 14. <coughs> there are a lot of verses this morning which is why I'm just kind of going through them there are one or two verses and probably 20 or 25 different places yet God does not take away life but he devises means 
so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. 2 Samuel 14, 14. Just find it? Okay. So God is designed, devising ways for his children to avoid death and to return to communion with him. In Psalms, Psalm 3, 8, we are told that the way of return is from him only. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That's Psalm 3.8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And then in Psalm 37.39. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And in Psalm 68.20. Our God is the God of salvation. And to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. Now, I will get with any of you that you would like and give you all of the scriptures that are used here later if you want to try to just... It's going to be hard to follow them because every other sentence is a scripture here. But we've just seen two more things that we can add to our list of attributes for salvation. One, it comes only from God. And two, it is an escape from death. As we continue to look through the book of Psalms, we find in Psalm 86, verse 13, For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Salvation has its foundation in God's mercy. Psalm 98, 2 and 3, The Lord has made known His salvation. His righteousness He has openly shown in the sight of the nations. He has remembered His mercy and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Salvation is not a secret thing. It's not something that God keeps hidden from the world. Salvation is something that God has made sure that the whole world will become aware of. And he promises that it will reach every corner of the earth before his son returns. So it's not secret. Psalm 106, 4 through 8. This is one of the longer sections. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power known. Two things from that section that we take as attributes. With salvation comes inheritance, which is to say we become heirs to God, and salvation reveals the mighty power of God. In Isaiah, Isaiah 1:18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Salvation cleanses us. It washes our scarlet sins as white as snow and purifies us in the eyes of God Almighty. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Going right into Ezekiel 18.32 For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. Joel 2.32 
And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I threw all those together right there. Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Joel. And what we get out of all of that is God, our Creator and Father, the same God who declared the consequences for sin to be eternal death, the same God who issued the punishment declares himself that he takes no pleasure in our punishment. Now as parents we understand that. When our children break the rules and we have to punish them, we don't get any pleasure out of punishing our children. But we know it's something that must be done. And we hope that they will turn from that direction and do things right in the future. God feels the same way. God actually tells us in Scripture, therefore turn and live. He wants us to receive the pardon or salvation which He has provided. And provided in abundance. So, how many attributes of salvation have we discovered in the Old Testament? Now this is just the Old Testament. Let's look at everything we have so far. Salvation provides freedom. It comes only from God. It is an escape from eternal death. It is founded in God's mercy. And it is not a secret. Salvation makes us heirs to God. It reveals God's awesome power. It cleanses us of sin. It pleases God by relieving our punishment. And God wants us to have it and therefore provides it in abundance. All of that just from the books of the Old Testament. And they'll believe me, there was a whole lot more. This was all from before the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus, which would be the means of our salvation. It absolutely amazed me when I began to realize just how little I really understood about the relationship between me and my God and my salvation. There are so many attributes that God told us about in the Old Testament through His prophets that were going to be attributes of salvation we would receive once Jesus came. Looking at the New Testament, we begin in Matthew uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I think that everyone who considers themselves a Christian, and probably most of the people in the world who know anything at all about Christianity, are aware that we look upon Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. We believe that Jesus was fully man and that he was fully God. And that his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross was the means by which God the Father fulfilled his promise to Adam and Eve. His promise of a way for their descendants to overcome the curse of sin and death. Now I realize that, as we said before, this promise of which I speak is an implied promise from the verses we read earlier in Genesis. But I think that most theologians and most lay Christians agree that it is a promise that was made. God promised Adam and Eve that their descendants would have a way to salvation. As I mentioned at the start of today's message, we're going to be looking at how to receive salvation further along in this series of messages. I did want to bring Jesus' birth into our thinking at this point, however, so that as we are looking at more of the attributes of salvation that we're going to look at briefly in the New Testament, we will have in mind that the express purpose of Jesus' birth was to bring into the world a means of achieving salvation for God's children. 
That's why he was born. Now as we continue looking at salvation, which I believe, and I'm going to put forth this as a premise, I believe that salvation can be considered synonymous with Jesus himself. So with that in mind, we will move to Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you agree with my premise that Jesus is synonymous with salvation, then he tells us here in his own words that salvation is restful to our souls. So we can add restful to our list of attributes. Moving on to Mark 2.17, we read, He, that is Jesus, He said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Salvation is also healing to the sick of soul and the sick of spirit. Jesus tells those around him in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Salvation helps us when we are lost. It guides us back to the right spiritual path. The path God desires for us to be on. Of course, in talking about salvation, we cannot overlook John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Again, that's the premise that Jesus and salvation are synonymous Salvation, from what we just read, two more attributes. Salvation is loving, and salvation is non-condemning. John 6, 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Salvation satisfies a spiritual hunger and quenches a spiritual thirst. In other words, salvation nourishes our soul. Whether we realize that we're in need of it or not, our soul is in need of nourishment if we're in a state of pre-salvation. Romans 5.15 But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Now we saw in the Old Testament, the very first attribute that I pointed out to you about salvation was freedom. The first attribute of salvation was freedom. Well, we're right now we're just reading in Romans 5.15 that salvation not only brings freedom, but salvation is free. It doesn't cost us anything. The price, the full price, for our salvation has already been paid. It was paid on the cross. Paid by the blood of Jesus. We'll get further into that when we get more into salvation. But in addition to, to freedom, free is another attribute. Here's a little different twist I wanted to throw in here. This is a negative attribute, if you will. Actually, it's positive, really, but it's a little twist I found in 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross is salvation. So what this is telling us, therefore, is to those who are perishing, those who refuse Jesus Christ, to them, the only attribute of salvation is foolishness. Now we know that they're wrong. But I wanted to point that out to you. Paul reiterates in the same statement that for Christians, salvation reveals the power of God. 
and we've already brought that out as one of the attributes earlier in the Old Testament. Getting back to the positive attributes in Colossians 1, 21 and 22. All you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable in his sight. Salvation is reconciling. And salvation presents us to God as holy, blameless, and irreproachable. We couldn't even be presented to God without salvation. In our sinful state, God could not tolerate us in his holy presence. But because of salvation, as we are presented to God, we are holy, we are blameless, and we are without reproach. Titus 2, 11 through 13 for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Salvation teaches. It teaches us how to live. And it provides us with hope. There's more. There's so much more. So much, in fact, that there's no way I could present it without reading the Bible page to page. Because that's what the Bible is. It's a story of salvation. It provides... Well, I better wrap it up here. Let me summarize what we've looked at so far today. Recalling what we gathered from the Old Testament quickly, here are the attributes of salvation. It provides freedom. It comes only from God. It is an escape from eternal death. It is founded in God's mercy. We recall that it is not a secret. It makes us heirs to God. It reveals God's awesome power. It cleanses us of sin. It pleases God by relieving our punishment. God wants us to have it, and it is provided for us in abundance. That's 11. Then from the New Testament, we can add to the list. Salvation is the fulfillment of God's promise. It is restful. It's healing. It's nourishing for our soul. It provides guidance. It is loving. It's non-condemning. To the unbeliever, it's foolishness. We're not going to count that. But to us, it is reconciling, and it presents us to God as holy, blameless, and irreproachable. That's 20 so far. It teaches us to live and gives us hope. 22. And let's not forget, it is absolutely free. Now that's 22 basic attributes. 23 basic attributes that we can contribute, I mean, we can attribute to salvation. And once again, if you look with me at the premise that salvation is synonymous with Jesus, then we can also add that salvation is the truth, the light, the way, it is the resurrection, and of course it is love. That's 28 things that we can say about salvation in helping us to understand what salvation is. When you're talking to someone who is an unbeliever and they see only the foolishness of salvation and you want them to understand what salvation truly is, you're not going to reel off these 28 attributes. So here's what I'd ask you to focus on when you're talking to someone and you want to explain what salvation is to them. Tell them that salvation is nothing less than this. It is God's promise. It is His sacrifice. It is our deliverance. And it is the only way to eternal life and communion with our Creator. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Amen.